All right, so now we've got, we know how the blood gets out of the heart. We know how it gets back to the heart. But remember, this is where the party happens. Now, diffusion we've heard of, right? Diffusion is the movement of materials from an area of high low. High low, high low. Just like blood goes from high pressure to low pressure, stuff, solutes, move from high concentration to low concentration. And so this is, so getting stuff across the wall of this capillary, that's what we're talking about, capillary exchange. Now remember, most of your capillaries are continuous capillaries, right? That's what we got continuous and fenestrated and sinusoids this morning, right? Okay, so you've got this thin layer of endothelial tissue, simple squamous epithelial tissue. So that's what you've got across, real thin <coughs> cell. So we have diffusion, you also have something called filtration and reabsorption. We will see filtration and reabsorption again when we get particularly to the urinary system. So don't, don't uh, do a, cram this in and do a cord up. Got to remember this stuff. Now, of course the concentration gradient is the difference in concentration of a substance between one area to, the, to another. So most of the time in the capillaries, you're going to have more oxygen on the inside and more carbon dioxide on the outside. And we know that oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble. They can squeeze right between those phospholipid lipid bilayers of the cell membrane. And so they don't have any problem, carbon dioxide doesn't have any problem diffusing into the bloodstream. Oxygen doesn't have any problem diffusing out. And that's good. As long as you're dealing with lipid soluble substance, substances, you're okay. But remember, if you're dealing with hydrophilic, water soluble substances, then you've got to have something. They can't just slide right through those lipid bilayers. So you've got to have channels for ions and water. Um, you've got to have carrier proteins for things like amino acids, uh, glucose molecules, and those things to cross. So diffusion works best when the distance is small, and so capillary is very thin wall, when the concentration gradient is large, and when the substance is moving are small. So if you have um, water soluble things, water ions, glucose, etc., they can actually squeeze in between adjacent endothelial cells. That's one way they can do it. They can go through the pores if you have fenestrated capillaries. Or they can go through channels. They have to go through a channel on one side and a channel on the other side. Does that make sense? Whereas lipid soluble substances just slide right through. Now, because most of your capillaries are continuous, large substances stay in here. Proteins stay in here. They're only in certain areas, the fenestrated capillaries, the sinusoids, or you actually have to have endocytosis and exocytosis to get large proteins from in here out here. Since most of your capillaries are continuous, proteins tend to stay inside the bloodstream. Proteins do not cross unless there is actually a particular reason for them to do so. And then of course lipid soluble materials have no problem. Now, so diffusion happens if there's a concentration gradient and if there's a mechanism for the materials to get across that uh, wall of the catheter. Now, filtration is basically using fluid pressure, hydrostatic pressure, to force fluid and anything dissolved in that fluid out of the capillary. So here at the beginning, of the capillary, the blood pressure is going to be greater than it is here because blood pressure drops just the further you move from the further away from the heart that you move. And so filtration occurs on the arterial end of the capillaries. And so in addition to diffusion that's going on, you have filtration. So basically, fluid pressure, the blood pressure forcing fluid through the capillary 
cells through the wall of the capillary into the interstitial tissue. And so one of the reasons we worry about blood pressure is that if blood pressure begins to drop, first of all, you're going to have issues actually getting blood to flow, but you're not getting the filtration of the stuff out of the bloodstream into the tissues. This is particularly critical in the kidneys. When you go into shock, when your blood pressure drops, when you go into shock, one of the first things that shuts down is the kidneys. And so there's not enough pressure, not enough blood pressure to filter the blood to get the, the, the waste materials out of the bloodstream. So your production essentially stops. Does that make sense? We'll come back to that when we get to the kidney. Reabsorption is the other way. Reabsorption is taking fluids and whatever's dissolved in those fluids back into the capillary. Reabsorption is due to osmotic pressure. Because in most of your capillaries on the inside, because most of your capillaries are continuous capillaries, proteins tend to stay in. Those proteins are dissolved in the plasma of the blood. And as the blood moves through this capillary, blood pressure begins to drop, right? But the osmotic pressure, the sucking force of the stuff dissolved in the, in the blood here, mainly the proteins, stays the same from one in this capillary to the other. Because the proteins don't leave, they're too big. Make sense? And so what happens at the venual end of the capillary is that the osmotic pressure, the, the fluid wanting, the water wanting to go back into where all this stuff is, is greater than the blood pressure. And so fluid is reabsorbed. So we say at this end, blood pressure is greater than osmotic pressure, filtration at this end, blood pressure, blood, blood pressure is less than osmotic pressure reabsorption occurs. But the, the, the big thing to remember is that the proteins don't leave. Remember that anything stuff sucks, right? Anything that's dissolved wants to suck water toward it, right? And so since the proteins don't leave, as the blood pressure drops, the, the fluid pressure that's forcing fluid out decreases, and then the osmotic pressure sucks more fluid back in that can be forced out. <coughs> Filtration occurs, this is what I was saying up here, when capillary hydrostatic pressure, blood pressure, <laughs> capillary hydrostatic pressure, it's just blood pressure. It's just the blood pressure in the capillaries. I don't know why they have to make this complicated. When the capillary hydrostatic pressure is greater than the blood flow and osmotic pressure. That means the osmotic pressure due to the proteins. That's what that um, colloid refers to the proteins that are dissolved in the, in the uh, plasma. I like it more simple. When blood pressure is greater than osmotic pressure, filtration occurs. Fluid is forced out of the capillary. Both of these pressures are inside the capillary. Blood pressure tends to force fluid out. Osmotic pressure sucks it back in. Reabsorption occurs when the, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> when the osmotic pressure, the, the force sucking fluid in, is greater than the force, the blood pressure forcing it out. And the big thing that changes from one end of the capillary to the other is just blood pressure. Because we know the further we move away from the heart, the lower the blood pressure gets. Now, for those of us that are mathematically minded, you can have what's called the net filtration pressure. If you take the CHP, which is essentially the blood pressure, and subtract from that the osmotic pressure, if you get a positive number, filtration occurs. If you get a negative number, reabsorption occurs. That's all we're saying. So if you look at this, here's the arterial. At this end, blood pressure is about 35. <laughs> osmotic pressure is about 25. You get a plus 10. Fluid's going to be forced out. In the middle, they, they're pretty much equal. At the end, if you look at this, this is osmotic pressure, 25, 25, 25. It doesn't really change. But it's the blood pressure that goes from 35 to 25 to about 18. This is what I was getting at with the comment. About 24 liters a day. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, how many liters of blood have I got? 
four or five, you know. And at least 40% or so is actually red cells, not even plasma, right? So I'm filtering 24 liters of fluid out of my bloodstream, out of my capillaries a day. Fortunately, I reabsorb most of it. But now 24 minus 20.4 leaves me how many liters of fluid in the tissues? 3.6, right? Almost two two liter drinks of fluid. My gosh, wouldn't that swell up? I mean, fluid in the tissues, that's edema, right? And essentially that's where this fluid is going. Out of the bloodstream, out of the capillaries into the tissues, right? So why am I swell up? That's a big function of the lymphatic system. 